Hello, this is Dennis Pullis. Welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video I'm going to present a PowerPoint talk I gave at ICSA 7, Brave New World, Genetic Engineering and Human Dignity, on August 3rd, 2012. I, I want, want to, to thank, thank Oscar, Oscar Grunewald. I dropped him an email and told him that my book was was ready, and he was kind enough to uh, invite me to come and give uh, a talk about my book. And I have quickly tried to adapt it to the <laughs> to the milieu here. And so um, I decided that the theme I talk about is humans by reason participate in divine providence. This is Aquinas' theme in his treatise on law in the Summa Theologiae. The relevance to our conference theme is that genetic engineering takes evolution into our own hands. I've shown earlier that evolution manifests divine providence, and human dignity is based on the same imago dei, the same image and likeness of God by which we participate in divine providence. Is reason a participation in divine providence? If it is, then we have a warrant for taking evolution into our own hands. The warrant is not absolute, but demands respect for God's providential ends. Human dignity is threatened by ignoring the imago dei, which warrants our acts. Closing the loop. Human dignity is the basis for our warrant. We have a biblical warrant. In Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image and likes, and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and the beasts, and the whole earth, and every creeping creature that moves upon the earth. The Imago Dei, the image and likeness of God that we just read about in Genesis 1.26, is often thought to be a physical image. But of course, God is a spirit, and we do not look like God. God is invisible. So what is the image? According to St. Augustine, the image of God within us is based on a Trinitarian understanding of God. The Father is the source of the Trinity. In humans, the source term is memoria, which is not to be confused with our English memory, but which means essentially intelligible being. It is the being that we receive from God as our creator. The Son is the Logos, the Word of God. He is the Father's image and self-understanding. This is mirrored in our intellect, which allows us to have self-awareness, to understand who and what we are, to understand the reality that is being held in existence by God. The Holy Spirit is the love binding the Father and the Son. And in us, it is imaged by will, which allows for self-acceptance, by which we accept the self that God has given us and accept what we really are. This is the recipe for psychological well-being, recognizing our true reality and accepting ourselves as we are is the basis of well-being. But this understanding is threatened by naturalism. My book provides a reasoned framework for this kind of discussion. Its major themes include my projection paradigm, God's existence, the role of mind in evolution. Evolution is not random, but is intentional, and the integrity of human nature. So let's look at the first thing, the projection paradigm. Projections are limited ways of knowing reality. Human thought is limited by finite experience, an individual perspective, and the conceptual space that we work in, that we receive from our culture. Limited ways of knowing reality are illustrated by the example of a house. Imagine a real house, such as the one I pictured here. It's complex. It has not only its structure, but its context and its decoration, even the dirt on it and the plants around it. 
But when we try to formulate what the house is, we do so by abstractions. For example, architects use architectural projections, and that's where I get the term projection. Architectural projections are two-dimensional views of the house taken from a certain perspective. The goal that we have is to develop a model using all projections. When we do this, we recombine the projections, matching their edges. For example, the edge of the side elevation has got to match the edge of the front elevation. The result is a 3D model. But the model is not the reality. It's missing many things, many contextual details that the reality has. It's only a model. There's a further example of projections. Consider the watch that William Paley talked about in trying to prove the existence of God by reflecting on design. Naturalists would have us believe that because there are mechanisms, there are no ends. They really have no good argument against ends in nature. They merely want us to focus on mechanisms to the exclusion of ends. But mechanisms and ends are fully compatible. We understand the mechanism of a watch, but that doesn't preclude the watch from having the end of telling time. Here in this conference, we have a tension between two projections, humans as genetically determined organisms and humans as morally free agents. My second theme is God as the source of laws. Naturalists substitute the laws of nature for divine providence. I argue in my book, as the constancy of energy implies a law conserving energy, so the constancy of the laws of nature imply God as a maintainer of those laws. Thus, the laws of nature are God's providential plan or matter. It's not a question, as naturalists assume, of either divine providence or the laws of nature. Rather, the laws of nature are the means by which divine providence is exercised. My third theme is that evolution evidences mind. I discussed this in my article, Mind or Randomness in Evolution. Quantum physics tells us that there are no random processes except observations. And there were no observations before the evolution of man or other intelligent life forms. So all of evolution proceeded without observation and therefore without randomness. The laws of nature are intentional. This is an important thing that I prove in my book. Evolution has target forms. Again, I discuss this in detail in my book. Evidence for target forms includes convergent evolution, punctuated evolution, and the existence of means in advance of ends. Toolkit genes evolve long before the need for them arises. And evolution confirms teleology, the idea that processes are directed toward ends. Aristotle makes three falsifiable predictions for teleology, and evolution confirms each and every one. The fourth theme is an integral model of human nature. We have a tension between two conceptual spaces, the scientific description of man and the spiritual realities of human existence. What we need is an integral model of human nature. Is such a model possible? I believe it is, and attempt to show it in my book. The integral model of human nature is based on many projections, that is to say, many kinds of data. Third-person data, including neuroscience, cybernetics, which includes artificial intelligence and computers as a model of the mind, first-person data like qualia, awareness, agency and will, and semiotics, how ideas represent reality. Ideas do not represent reality in the same way as ordinary external signs do. Ideas are a two-term relationship. 
when I think of an apple, that thought refers to the apple directly. But when I read the word apple, I have to first recognize that it is a word. Then that word has to generate within me the thought apple. And finally, that thought refers to the apple. So in the case of external science, we have a three-part relationship. While in the case of our thoughts, our internal science, our ideas, we have a two-part relationship. And so the two kinds of science are completely different. And it only confuses the matter to try to identify one with the other. If there's a third-person projection and a first-person projection, shouldn't there be a second-person projection? Yes, I think that there is. And it's found in Martin Buber's I-Thou relations. I-Thou relations are subject-subject relations. And they're impossible without the recognition that we are dealing with another subject. It would be easy to avoid controversial data, but it would be cowardly. So I address it directly and in detail. I consider the placebo effect, which show that our mind can often heal our body. Near-death experiences, which provide evidence of awareness in the absence of measurable brain activity. Parapsychology, which shows that our intentions can control external objects. And it shows it to 16 or 18 standard deviations way beyond the norm set for the existence of the new Higgs boson. And finally, I consider mystical experience, by which we are directly aware of God. Again, this is a peculiar kind of experience because it has awareness in the absence of content. Mystical experiences can be content-free, and yet they give us an awareness of reality. So the standard options for a model of human nature are physicalism, which is basically materialism. And it incorporates the third person projection that we find in science. It has an inadequate account of the first person projection. As David Chalmers has pointed out, this is the hard problem on which neuroscience and cognitive theories have made no progress. No one has any idea of how to reduce awareness, intentionality, and consciousness to physical processes. The other model is dualism. It incorporates both first and third person projections, but it has an inadequate account of their relation. This is the so-called mind-body problem. How can mind affect body? Or for that matter, how can our bodily senses affect our mind? It also has the problem of making personal unity problematic. If we are two substances, how can we be a single person? Is there a third option? Yes. Before Cartesian dualism, there was Thomistic hylomorphism. It sees the body and soul as two projections of one person. That is to say, that body and soul are not separate substances, but two ways of viewing a single person. If we view a person as physical, we're talking about the body. If we view a person as intentional, as involved in spiritual activities, then we're talking about the soul. This incorporates both first and third person projections, as dualism does. But it has an adequate account of their relationship. So there's no mind-body problem. The adequate account is that the soul is essentially the law of the body. And laws and the things that they govern are inseparable. They are only distinguished by reason. They are not separate in reality. However, Thomistic hylomorphism has an inadequate account of universal laws of nature. It places all intelligibility in the individual form. So each species has its own individual form. And there is no reason to think that universal laws apply to different species of material beings. This is very problematic. And it is probably the reason why Thomistic hylomorphism disappeared with the advent of Newtonian physics. The integral model of human nature does have a solution, however. 
and the solution is my two subsystem theory of mind. Like to mystic holomorphism, it sees the body and soul as two projections of one person. It incorporates first and third person projections. It has the same adequate account of their relationship with the soul being the law of the body. And it has an adequate account of universal laws. How is this? It is because, unlike to mystic hylomorphism, part of the intelligibility of a human being is in his matter. Matter has dispositions to act in certain ways, and those dispositions, which we call the laws of nature, are universal. So the two subsystem theory involves a physical subsystem and an intentional subsystem. The physical subsystem is essentially the body, while the intentional subsystem is our soul, the law of the body, which also provides awareness. The mind, unlike Cartesian dualism, is distributed between the body and the soul. The physical subsystem accounts for the third person projection of the mind for our neurophysiology, while the intentional subsystem accounts for the first person projection of mind and our intentionality. The physical subsystem provides for data processing, and the intentional subsystem provides awareness and direction. The physical subsystem is approximately described by universal laws, but our intentional subsystem perturbs those laws, as is shown by experiments in parapsychology. Because the body provides data processing capabilities to the mind, damaging the body, damaging the brain, or stimulating it in various physical ways, will affect the contents that the data processing processes. As a result, our awareness will be an awareness of modified or defective contents. Thus, the model is able to account for all of the data on neurophysiology while still allowing awareness to be a distinct subsystem. Integration is accomplished by subordination. For example, in a living person, the laws of hydraulics serve to circulate the blood. But if the body is damaged, the laws of hydraulics have their own separate agenda and can result in our bleeding to death. So reason is a participation in divine providence. We do have a warrant for taking evolution into our hands. The warrant is not absolute, but demands respect for God's providential ends. And human dignity is affirmed by the Imago Dei, which in turn warrants our acts. Thank you very much. You can read more about this in my book, God, Science, and Mind, The Irrationality of Naturalism.